And, and Thomas, um, after Let the Right One In, you were kind of a very hot property. Everybody wanted you to direct their next horror film. Um, and clearly you didn't, though it is a kind of horror film in, in some ways. So, so what was it about this that made you want to make a film about kind of paranoid, miserable spies and who are tormented by their guilt and secrets? I don't know. It's, it's, it's quite easy to know when, when you turn on uh, to something you read. Uh, it, it's when, when, when you read something that creates images and you get a lot of images. It's all about that, really. And uh, I, I, I sort of, um, after that film, I was terrified by the um, attention, really. And uh, I, I didn't really know what to do. But um, this came up, and I thought it was too, uh, so impossible, it interested me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are similarities because it's they're both about characters who kind of live in the shadows. I mean, vampires and, and spies. So, mm -hmm. could you see thematic similarities within it? Was that one of the? No, I I can't. But maybe it's true. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's true. I don't know. But but you were. F I mean, when I when it was announced that you were doing it, I thought what a fantastic kind of idea, a kind of outsider's perspective on this very sort of English tale. Uh, yet you knew the story, didn't you? You'd. You'd seen it as a child. You, you're quite an anglophile in, in some. Well, we we are in in Sweden. We're quite breastfed on on uh, British television. Um, you you knew always in the 70s. You heard the oh, the Thames television, and you had like the London weekend, and then there was this Granada. The man uh, sitting on a horse. Anglia. Uh, Anglia, sorry. Uh, <laughs> and you knew it, it was going to be wet uh, or damp tweed. Uh, uh, and uh, it's sort of... Uh, 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 so I think uh, I got uh, a lot of that from, from my, my childhood. Uh, and uh, I travel a lot here in the 70s, so, so uh, that was a great inspiration. Mm. I mean, the, the, the original kind of uh, 79 miniseries cast a very long shadow. Uh, did you have any kind of trepidation about uh, taking on this? And, and you as well, Peter? You know, it's, it's like uh, you and I sitting here in the very same room. I see this and you see that, and it's the same room. Uh, if it's a good source material, uh, you could have completely different views on the same thing, and and uh, it was uh, the 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 TV series was very well made, and uh, it was great to have uh, when when we started uh, working with this, as uh, you know, just to to get the the whole intrigue uh, clear. Um, but uh, I I think you, if it's a good source material, you. You, you shouldn't be afraid. It's it's easy to get a new view if it's good. Mm. What about you, Gary? I mean, did the ghost of kind of Guinness <coughs> hang over this for you at all? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I I did I did not say yes to this immediately because of that. Um, it was obviously a wonderful opportunity, and a, and a, you know it's not every day you get asked to play George Smiley. Um, but um, a little, you know, the, the voice inside Gary's head that doesn't like him <laughs> uh, was saying, you know, who do you think you are? <laughs> you know, um, it, it, he made it so, it was so popular. I re I'm of an age, I remember the series, and um, y y one would adjust one's social calendar in the days before VCRs and and TiVo, um, you, would, you would set aside that hour on a Sunday night, I think it was, and you would watch Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. And he made, it, obviously Smiley is a, a very, as an iconic literary character, but, but Guinness popularized him, and, and it was much beloved. <coughs> and so um, I, I was sort of like, you know, it was a bit cheeky really to, to step into those 
the great shoes. Um, but uh, he convinced me, a and he saw something there. So, uh, but it wasn't an immediate. It w I, I had that sort of thing of I, I would I'd, I'd say to my manager, uh, tell them yes, I, I, I'm in. And then about an hour later, I'd call him and I say, have you called them yet? And he <laughs> said, no, London's, you know, it's 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 not open yet. <laughs> and um, and I uh, I would say. Uh, uh, don't call them. It, I, I need to think about this a bit more. So, you know, and then the next morning I'd call him and I'd say, no, I've, I have to do it. I have to play it. So it was, it was a little like that for, for a week or two. Um, and then I sent you an email. Yeah. And uh, I said, uh, I, I sent Thomas an email that just said, I'm in. And he sent me back a smiley face. <laughs> 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 I, was over, I was overhearing you uh, make in an interview the other day in which I think you put your finger on it you said because uh, it's, it's very easy to be put into the position of uh, being afraid of doing something because of uh, a, a wonderful and iconic performance like Alec Guinness's which it certainly was but what you said which you might have forgotten I don't know is you said the way in which you approached it was as any classical actor would approach a classical part. Uh, there's yes. many, many ways to yes. skin a rabbit, you know. There's, uh, it's, yes. it, it's, you know, there is no such thing as being uh, uh, completely definitive. Yeah. I mean, John yeah. would know this. One of the, the, you know, one of the great, the great things about being an actor is you get getting the phone call. I always think it's great. Oh, when that's you get the it. best bit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and they go, "You're playing Hamlet," and you go, "I'm playing Hamlet," and then you go. <laughs> and, uh, and then, of course, you've got to do all the work. Yeah. And, uh, but yes, you're right. I, I, at, the, at the end of the day, I walked through that fire and, and approached it as, as one might a classical role that, that there had been uh, James Mason and Dan O'Malley and Anthony Hopkins and, and, and Guinness. And this was. This was Gary's interpretation. Mm. But yeah. it sounded like you were kind of, your voice is sort of not a pastiche. I mean, it sounds like you're kind of mining Guinness in a little way. I mean, well, it's funny because I heard yeah. you on the radio the other day, yeah. a clip from the film, and it sounded very much like Alec Guinness, but when I see you on the film, it, it's, it sounds different with your... With well, your it could have sound like this, could <laughs> <it? laughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a mole at the top of the screen. <laughs> Um, it, no, I don't know. I, I think um. I, um, I, we, we, had, we had access to uh, John le Carre and, um, and we met that morning mm -hmm. and, um, and I had heard, uh, I'd heard him on the radio and I had some uh, recordings and uh, so, um, I mean, I don't sound... I, I mean, I don't have that vocal, that set of pipes that, that Alec Guinness had. And it, it had that very Eeyore sound. And it was very Eeyore. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I think I'm doing a little bit of Lucare. I, I, I stole a bit of, uh, of his... Yeah, of, you do. Yeah, of his voice and some of his mannerisms. And I just thought, well, here's the here's the DNA. Here is go go right to the go right to the guy. So, what kind of input did Le Carrier have throughout the whole process, from you writing the script to, you know, directing the movie and then being on set? Because obviously he has a little camera as he well. Was, so he was tremendously generous from the beginning. I mean, uh, Bridget and I met him uh, right at the beginning, uh, and he was we we went to his house, and he was quite stern. I remember in the morning, um, we were quite nervous. <laughs> And then he took us out to lunch, and he he, uh, he ordered a bottle of wine, and and then he became much more benign after that. <laughs> <laughs> and it was very sweet, and he, you know, he told us lots of great stories, and he said, you know, it's a fantastic raconteur, any kind of, he, he was lovely. And he, he always said, you know, I'll, I'm not going to intrude, but if you, if you need me, I'm here. And we took him up on that, and we talked to him a lot about um, you know, problems or ideas for scenes. And, and just in the course of meeting him several times, anecdotes came up about his time in, in MI5 and MI6 some of which made it into the film. So the Christmas party originally came from an anecdote he told us about 
Uh, I think MI5 having a Christmas party, they got a bit out of hand, and someone started throwing bottles out the window and the police were called to break it up. <laughs> Which we, <laughs> really like the idea of the police coming to stop the spies having a party. And did, uh, so <laughs> did they have Santa Lenin then? Or was that your idea? Uh, was that, was that Santa what was Lenin. I, I can't remember if we made that up or not, the Russian, the thing the Russian, I think he, that possibly was also came from it sounds too good for us to I make it up. I think we made it up, and we asked him if it would be possible, and, and he, he said, he, yes, yeah, 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 why not? <laughs> <laughs> so he was fantastic generous. Yeah, he helped us all the way through <laughs> in terms of the script. Yeah. Okay. Mm. But what about working with him for you, Thomas? Uh, he, he, he was extremely, as Peter said, very generous. And he said, uh, when, when we started, he said, please do not do the, the book. It already is, it exists. The TV series already exists, and uh, please do something new, uh, and um, explore this in your own way, and uh, please uh, take the responsibility of this, and, and uh, I'll be helpful. And uh, it, it's a fantastic opportunity to, to have, and, and uh, he's been great. Uh, John, can I ask you about Thomas and what he's like as a director on set? Is he is he very detailed? Is he does he allow the actors room for improvisation? How how does it work? Oh, I was dreading this question. <laughs> <laughs> he's a monster. <laughs> uh, well, I think what uh, I've got great. Great. I, mean, I have wonderful things to say about Thomas, but I, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say them in front of him. Um, <laughs> Uh, but more than, more than anything, w watching Thomas work, he, he, he has the great generosity of casting and then saying, basically, uh, we've talked about it, I expect you to come with something, uh, uh, and I want what you bring. And so that's you unpack your bag and you say, well, this is what I've got to offer. And he says, thank you very much, two takes, fine, next, next shot. So on. But what was, what was interesting in watching him, because uh, you were talking about, you touched on it earlier when you said, uh, how do you manage to get this into two, two, into two hours and from literature? Because literature is such a different animal, and it so rarely happens that you get a good book and manage to make that journey into cinema, uh, into pure cinema. Uh, and just watching Thomas working and seeing the film, and seeing the film in respect to, to what the, the script was to, to start with, because it's not the same as it was when we started. It's been in, in the cutting room, it's been moved here, things have been moved there, images there. But he's constantly, constantly looking for image on screen, which is, as we all know, cinema. Uh, and it's, it, that's where the praising comes in. It's not actually a praising, it's a different way of saying it. And that, I think, is what, uh, what has happened with, uh, with this film, and certainly with, uh, with Let the Right One In as well. I love the way that, that Smiley doesn't seem to say anything for the kind of first 15... It seems to me like the first 15 minutes of, of the film, 15, 20 minutes. Was that in the script? Was that something you worked out on set? Or was that something that came in the editing? I don't remember. It, it I don't came remember. later. It came later, yeah. I think I... I, I answered the door and mm -hmm. originally originally Peter Gwillem called at the door and yeah and he says Peter yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a whole, yeah. Um, so, he so it was in the editing that, earlier, that yeah. you decided I mean the, a, a, a wonderful first line mm -hmm. yeah. but it's but it's that the kind of the use of silence that you did so well and let the right one in you kind of carried on in this that you you, you allow the main character not to say anything for you know well, so just, you, you get very interested don't you <laughs> When, when it's a silent, uh, I mean, silence is such a useful actor in cinema because it activates the audience. So, um, like, if I ask you a question and you don't answer, that is also an answer, and that activates you as a viewer. Why did Why didn't he answer? And uh, what is he thinking? Does he hate him? Or it, uh, silence is very activating on, on, on screen, and it's, uh, you, you shouldn't un underestimate it. 